In the previous lecture, we talked about whether you actually want to test a hypothesis. We also saw that one of the goals of a hypothesis test is to impress other people by making a prediction, then collecting some data that actually supports the prediction that you had. Very often, if we look at the kinds of predictions that people make, we see that they are not especially impressive. And by making riskier predictions, we could impress people more in the studies that we do. Now, not all predictions that we can test are equally exciting. Let's start with a clear and extreme case. Let's say that I design a study where I ask two different groups to rate their mood on a scale from 1 to 7. I make the prediction that the difference in the means between these two groups will fall between minus 6 and plus 6. Now, if I make this prediction, you are not going to be impressed. This is actually the entire range of possible values. It must be that the answer is somewhere on this scale. So my prediction is not especially exciting. Let's take a look at three questions that researchers can ask and evaluate these in terms of how risky they are. We'll look at a two-sided hypothesis, a one-sided hypothesis, and a range prediction. In each of these scenarios, the circle represents all possible outcomes. The white area represents the values that are predicted under the alternative hypothesis. And the black area represents the values that are not predicted or part of the null hypothesis. If we look at the left figure, the two-sided test, we see that the area that's not predicted is actually a line or even a single point, the null value. All other values are predicted under the alternative hypothesis in a two-sided test. Let's say that we make one perfectly accurate hypothetical observation represented by the blue line. It falls within the white area. It is a value that we predicted, so it supports our prediction. But because we basically predicted all possible outcomes, it's not particularly impressive. If we compare this with a one-sided hypothesis test in the center, we see that a null hypothesis test typically makes a directional prediction. For example, we predict that one group will score higher than another group. This means that all values of zero and lower than zero are not part of our prediction. They're part of our null hypothesis. We again collect data. We have exactly the same observation as before, the blue line, and it again falls into the predicted area. But we could have been wrong in many other ways. There's a much larger black area of values that we don't predict. So here our prediction is already more impressive. The right case where we have a specific range predict prediction of a couple of values that are exactly in line with our alternative model and most possible outcomes are actually not in line with our prediction. Here we again see this blue line as our perfect measurement. In this case, our alternative hypothesis is again supported. But we could have been wrong in even more ways than before. So this was an extremely risky prediction that is really impressive when confirmed. The idea of making risky predictions or performing a severe test is central to the work of a philosopher of science named Deborah Mayo. She talks about two versions of severity requirements, weak and strong. Let's first focus on the weak version. She writes, one does not have evidence for a claim if nothing has been done to rule out ways the claim may be false. The most extreme case of this is when we actually did not make our prediction before looking at our data, but after looking at the data. This is sometimes known as harking or hypothesizing after results are known. This is basically the least severe test that you can possibly perform. You already know what the data looks like. You've created a hypothesis that supports the data that you already know exists. So this is not a severe or risky test of any hypothesis. It's not impressive at all. There's also a stronger version of the severity argument. If a claim passes a test that was highly capable of finding flaws or discrepancies from the claim, and yet none or few are found, then the passing result is evidence for the claim. So in the weak severity statement, we see that if we don't have a severe test, we don't have any evidence. 
in this stronger version, we're actually saying that if something passes a severe test, we can interpret this as evidence for the claim, corroborating the prediction that we made. Now, studies can have a high capability of being wrong, either in a statistical sense, in a theoretical sense, or in a methodological sense. We can test specific predictions that are much more risky. We can create theories that have many more ways in which they can be wrong than right. And we can devise methods that are so strict that they will only allow a specific hypothesis of demonstrating an effect, but control all other ways of doing this. In the remaining of the lecture, I'll mainly talk about statistical severe tests, but it's very important to also keep in mind theoretically strict predictions or methodologically rigorous experiments. So if we again revisit the earlier example of a two-sided null hypothesis test, where we are not predicting only a finding of exactly zero, and all other findings are actually predicted under the alternative model. We see that this is not a specifically exciting prediction. We can make it more impressive by performing a one-sided test. Here, the null hypothesis is no longer just a single point, but it's all values of zero and smaller than zero in the situation where we're making a directional prediction that one group should score higher than another group. Our alternative hypothesis is not only half of all possible outcomes, namely greater values. There is again no need to divide all possible outcomes exactly at this dividing line of zero. There might be many situations where, for example, you didn't do a perfect experiment, there is a correlational study and you admit that a value of exactly zero or slightly larger than zero could all happen just due, due to this systematic noise. In these cases, it might be more impressive to say, well, let's specify a specific value that is not zero, but that is a specific value that we care about. In a minimal effect test, in this case, again, a one-sided minimal effect test, we still have our alternative hypothesis. We are still predicting one group will score higher than the other group on something that we measure. But now the difference shouldn't just be larger than zero, but it should be larger than some value that actually matters, that is slightly more impressive. Finally, we can make range predictions. An example of a range prediction is an equivalence test, where we are specifying a range around zero of all possible values that we are actually predicting. So in an equivalence test, we might predict that there is no meaningful difference between two groups. Our null hypothesis is now the range of all values that are large enough to matter. And what we're trying to do is statistically reject the presence of values large enough to matter. Our prediction is that the real value will be close to zero, somewhere in a very specific range. In the case of an equivalence test, this range is always around zero. We want to say that the observed data is equivalent to zero. But in another sense, you can think of an equivalence test as a range prediction that you could put anywhere on a scale. You could predict values that lie between, for example, a value of 0 0.1 and 0 0.6. Range predictions say we want theoretically relevant effects to be significant, but not theoretically irrelevant effects. We have certain predictions that we want to be true, but only predictions within a certain range. Not anything goes, but some specific values that would actually be in line with what our theory is predicting. Range predictions also allow you to design a study that can be falsified on clear criteria. If you observe data that falls outside of the range that you're predicting, then your prediction is falsified. So making a riskier prediction gives your theory more verisimilitude. There were more ways in which you could be wrong. And if you nevertheless pass this risky test, we are quite impressed and we think that your theory has something going for it. Another interesting thing is that many of the criticisms on the use of hypothesis tests, especially null hypothesis tests and p-values, actually disappear when p-values are calculated for these types of range predictions. For example, 
we no longer have the problem that will observe a statistically significant effect for effect sizes that are too small to be meaningful. When we perform a null hypothesis test with very large samples, we might find statistical differences for very tiny effects that we don't actually care about. But in the case of a minimal effect test, we have actually tested against the value that we have determined is practically meaningful to begin with. So whenever we find a statistical significant result in a minimal effect test, as a consequence, it is also practically meaningful. A related issue is that in non-experimental research, where we look at correlational data, for example, due to the systematic noise, there will always be tiny differences. So in a large enough sample size, which we're seeing more and more now that we have big data, any correlational finding can be statistically significant, even if it doesn't really matter in practice. By putting a range around zero, so not just testing against the value of zero, but a range around zero, it's possible to observe tiny differences, they will not be statistically significant in our new range prediction. So this helps us again to prevent finding significant results that actually don't matter. Now imagine that we make a slightly more risky prediction. We have two groups and we predict a mean difference should be larger than 0.1 on some scale that we're using to be practically meaningful to begin with. And theoretically, the value that we observe should also be smaller than 0.6, because this is just too large to be predicted by our theory. So we are predicting values within a certain range between 0.1 and 0.6. We collect some data, then we perform a hypothesis test, or in this case we might just look at the mean value of about 0.38. We look at the confidence interval around this and we see that we can reject both this upper bound in our range prediction of 0.6 as our lower bound of 0.1. So we can reject both of these values. The data that we have observed is statistically within a range that we predicted. So we have made a riskier prediction than in a traditional two-sided hypothesis test. And our prediction was confirmed, which is really impressive. The traditional null hypothesis test is only one of many ways in which you can test hypotheses. So if you're able to, try to make riskier predictions.